Hey everyone, it's high time for me to get into chapter three since it's already Wednesday night on week three when I'm recording this. Let's get into it. Get my head small here so I'm out of the way mostly. This is a great chapter from Whelan about deceptive description. We've spent the chapter in an assignment learning about how to use summary statistics or descriptive statistics to describe data and understand distributions within a data set. I've been grading your assignments. I'm not quite done, but I try and get them back within a week of when they're turned in, so that should come back to you soon. But I want to get started here on these key ideas from how we can be deceptive in our choices of describing a particular issue with data. Whelan starts out with a discussion of the difference between precision and accuracy and get my head out of the way there. Um, I want to just point out to y'all uh, in my experience teaching this chapter, this difference really sticks in students head a lot. The, the challenges of precision and accuracy. We do have an assignment coming up with a discussion of precision, uh, sorry, a discussion of some of these deceptive description, but uh, precision and accuracy is uh, a little bit of a trick that we see sometimes used to mislead people, but it's not one of our examples that we focus on in the readings. So don't let, don't let this, since it's the first thing we run into, I think people fixated on it being the most important, and it's probably not, I think, the most important thing in the chapter. All right. But it is worth thinking about the difference between precision and accuracy. Uh, people who have uh, have done target practice before are probably more familiar with this comparison about the difference between precision and accuracy. Uh, the Whelan example from within the chapter about the difference based on uh, the time of day is also a really good one. So, but the top left quadrant here of uh, low accuracy and low precision is bad at both. And contrasting that with that, with the top right, which is low accuracy but high precision, uh, is a good way of thinking about the difference between accuracy and precision. Um, accuracy means hitting the middle of the bullseye-ish, but maybe some randomness, like we see in the bottom left. Precision means that you've got a nice tight group and even if you're wrong, even if you're inaccurate, you're wrong in the same way every time. So uh, what we want, of course, is this one right here, high accuracy, high precision, uh, if we want to be accurate about describing the world. Uh, but very often we are uh, low accuracy and high precision, or even uh, low accuracy and low precision when we're tr describing events. The point that Whelan makes about the deceptive nature of accuracy and precision with respect to misleading people is that sometimes when we see a really precise figure given, we assume it must be not just precise, that it must also be accurate, it must be in this bottom right hand corner. However, because we often assume that, people have figured out cleverly that they can mislead us by presenting a really precise sounding figure uh, that is not at all accurate. And as a matter of fact, sometimes people make numbers up and give them a precise num figure like a to the nearest hundredth of a decimal place. Uh, we see some of this going on today with the discussion around uh, coronavirus deaths and uh, death rates and growth rates and the like, where someone will make up a seemingly really precise stat, or maybe they're not making it up, but they're, 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 it's an estimate that has really a really big margin of error on it, but they'll give you a really precise sounding estimate and people will repeat that number because that's the central estimate. And it seems like it's, it must be, it's, it's a precise number, it must be accurate. Whelan gives a few more examples of differences between precision and accuracy. He had a golf range finder, which is a little device you point at the green that tells you how far you are from the uh, from the hole. And uh, he had two problems and he couldn't figure out why he couldn't uh, play golf any better with this fancy device. Uh, and the first problem was that he had it set to meters instead of yards. And 
the difference between one meter and one yard is not that great, but the difference between 100 meters and 100 yards is pretty considerable when you're trying to get the, the ball onto the green and not hit the sand trap or a water, water obstacle or something. And then the second problem he had was that he wasn't experienced in aiming it. And so not only was it set to the wrong unit, so he was, you know, it's set to meters and he thought it was in yards. And in fact, it was reading in meters. So his estimate was off to begin with, but he also wasn't pointing it at the right thing. He didn't realize he thought he was pointing at the green, but his aim was a little off and he was pointing at the trees behind the green. So his estimates were way off. So he was having a, a good example of a precise reading. It was giving him a reading to the green in the, to the nearest probably tenth of a yard. But it was actually nowhere close to accurate because it was measuring something in meters, not yards, and the trees, not to the green. Another example he gives is the way Wall Street risk analysts are constantly building models where they predict the risk. Um, there's, a, there's a phrase called value at risk, which is the idea of how much your firm stands to lose if things really just fall apart, go south, and how much money you have leveraged, how many, how many bets you have out on the market at a given time that you can use to estimate your total exposure. And risk managers are paid a lot of money to try and calculate how much exposure they can tolerate uh, because the more exposure you have, the more money you make in a growing market, right? Uh, but the more risk you experience. So Wheatland's point is that uh, there were these really complicated, complex, and previous to 2008 robust uh, risk models that analysts were using to rely on and calculate how much risk their firms were exposed to. Um, and then all of a sudden, 2008 comes along and there is a crisis in the housing market and related effects in the market. And it was what some, sometimes is called a black swan effect, which is you can't predict um, that, that um, effect. So the the, the consequence of this inability to think about the total exposure of all stocks and all firms to the housing market was something that was fundamentally inaccurate about the models, even though the models were extremely precise about measuring the risk from a whole bunch of sectors, right? Uh, so that's one more example. I don't need to tell you that we have some more examples of this, right? So nobody running a, well, some hedge fund managers managed to find out uh, about some of the global risks around the pandemic. <laughs> some members of Congress might have <laughs> found out about the, the risks of the global, global pandemic uh, before the rest of the public knew. But by and large, a lot of firms really weren't prepared for the idea of what might happen if the novel coronavirus got out of um, China spread to places like the United States and started infecting people. So that kind of risk, in this case, pandemic risk, wasn't well estimated in many people's models, including a lot of financial firms' models. And uh, the stock market crashed as a consequence, right? Um, and so too, uh, a lot of public health experts had a model of risk that might not have been calibrated, might have been somewhat precise, but it wasn't well calibrated to the the actual um, possibility of uh, a pandemic. I have to hedge a little on that and say, by the way, that the global health experts were pretty much right about this, which was that they were sounding the alarm much earlier than anybody in finance was sounding the alarm about uh, risks to business. So global health experts were aware of and, uh, and, and pushing a lot of concern about the risk of a global pandemic, whereas most businesses were much slower to react. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, there's lots of examples uh, it, you know, out there today of a lot of firms that worked actively to downplay the risk uh, faced by a global pandemic or the possibility of a global pandemic. So um, not everyone's always inaccurate in the, in the same direction. All right, so that's the precision versus accuracy dis discussion. It's worth thinking about when you see a really precise number given 
And you have to ask yourself, how do they know exactly that number? Oh, I got a little, I got a little pop up there. Thanks, Zoom. I don't want to sign in right now. Go away, buddy. All right. <laughs> uh, excuse me for that. Uh, so that's the precision versus accuracy discussion. When you see a really precise number and you wonder how can it be that precise, it's worth thinking about whether it might be precise but not accurate, right? Or maybe it's a really precise estimate that's the central estimate, but the error bars are really big and there's actually a lot of potential for a much larger, much smaller number, right? But here gets the bigger problem, and this is what I, I think we really need to think about um, more than just precision or accuracy, is we might have really precise and really accurate statistics, but what if we're just not quite sure what the problem is? We don't have a clear definition of the problem. So this goes back to some of our readings about definitions from our Joel Best reading, for example. Um, but the point of this is, is that if we don't have a common language or a common agreement about what we're even trying to measure, we might end up doing this. We might just talk past each other. So in other words, I have my stats that prove I'm right, and you have your stats that prove you're right. And we say, and they're both precise, and they're both accurate, but we're convinced that we're right with our preferred statistical reasoning, right? When in fact, we're looking at the problem very different ways or looking at the solution to the problem, whatever we define it as, very different ways. One of the examples that Wheatland gives of this um, is the question, how is U.S. manufacturing doing? And I love this example because I think it really illustrates, um, it really is, illustrates a sort of a classic divide in some of the political consciousness of the United States today, um, which is that there's a lot of political rhetoric around manufacturing and manufacturing industries, and it all purports to be in the name of people employed by manufacturing. But what you'll find is that people have very different positions based on whether they're talking about the employees of U.S. manufacturers or whether they're talking about the corporations themselves. And that's two very different ways of looking at it, right? And so to some people's mind, a corporation doing well means that America is doing well because corporations pay people money and so that's the measure of success is if the corporation is doing well, that's great, right? Uh, I, don't need, I don't need to tell the, the people who are on the other side of this issue that other people look at it as, no, no, the corporation uh, is good for its shareholders, but not necessarily its employees. And so, yeah, shareholder value is increased by a corporation doing well, but we shouldn't use a corporation's well-being as a measure of how good U.S. manufacturing is, is if we're expecting it to be creating good middle-class jobs. So that therein lies the debate, right? Therein lies the, 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 the conversation. The problem is, is that people use one set of figures and the other set of figures, and they talk past each other on this a lot. Uh, if we wanna show that U.S. manufacturing is doing well, by the way, I'm gonna show you a bunch of charts, fairly high speed, the, the slide deck is up. You can check it out on our website if you want, but I'm not gonna to spend too much time explaining each one of these. I'm just gonna give the, relay the conversation using some data here. Um, this is a, these are a series of charts from FRED, which is a, a um, Fred, Federal Reserve Economic Database. Um, is that right? I'm actually gonna Google that because I don't wanna be wrong. Federal Reserve Economic Data, not database, economic data. Uh, and it's the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis uh, that has this great chart maker. I gave you a link on each one of these two, so you can either type that in or, uh, or uh, just go to the link within uh, the slide deck that I shared with y'all. If we wanna make the argument that US manufacturing is doing great, thank you very much, nothing to worry about here. Um, this chart ends in 2016, so thank you very much, President Obama. Um, since 2008, it's recovered completely and actually reached new highs. If I wanted to make the argument that it's all about President Trump, I could start a time series from 2016 and show that US manufacturing has been increasing steadily. Thank you very much, right? Um, but either way, it's a story of increase. This is a uh, real output, which means adjusted for inflation. Um, and so um, the 
I, I don't I don't know what the inflation measure is they adjust it for to make it a real output in terms of U.S. manufacturing output. You can you can go to the St. Louis Federal Reserve site and find that out if you want. Uh, but they've adjusted it over time so that it's it's growth is real growth. It's not just the dollars inflating or that the the um, the size of the population is inflating. So what we see is that there was a big dip in the um, early 2000s, a big dip in the 2008. Uh, and then uh, following 2009 recession, uh, but that it's recovered and things are great, right? Um, let me get my screen back, there we go. Uh, we can do the same thing if we look at this other index, which is a related but slightly different uh, index of industrial production. This goes back much farther in time, all the way back to the 1920s. And what we see here again is a really positive story. Look at that. that there was a big recession that really hurt manufacturing in the 2008-2009 period there, but then we're, we're back where we were before that and even a little higher. Fantastic. Good news, right? But wait a minute. Let's look at employment in manufacturing. And now it's a very different story. Man, U.S. manufacturing doesn't look very good here if we look at it this way, right? So now this is all employees. So we're looking at thousands of persons here on the y-axis. So 16,000, thousand is 16 million, 18 million, 20 million. The story being told by the graph here is that in the 40s and 50s, we had about 14 million people working. By the 70s, we saw around 18 million people working in manufacturing. And by the 90s, that number had fallen down to around 17 million. And then since the 2000s, we've seen a pretty consistent decline in manufacturing employment. Keep in mind that this is number of people working in manufacturing, even as the population of the United States has swelled from under 200 million to well over 300 million. So it's not just fewer people total working in manufacturing, which doesn't sound as good as the story I was just telling, right? It's also a lower percentage of the employment, right? Here's the story of why that is, because if we have manufacturing output growing, but employment shrinking, it must be because output per person is increasing. And that is in fact what's happening. The red line on here tells that story for us. This is employment in manufacturing as a proportion of all employees. We read that over here on the right. And so what we're seeing here is that in the World War II period and then post-war period, we saw manufacturing be around 30% or more of all jobs were in manufacturing. But look at the consistency of this decline. This red line is the consistency of the decline to where now it's less than 10% of all jobs in the United States are in manufacturing. What I want to take a minute to point out to you all here, because uh, I, I, can, I can come across as a little partisan sometimes, and I don't want to be a snipey guy uh, when we're trying to teach a, a really important real class about, uh, about data and its uses and abuses. I want to point out to you all the consistency of that red line. Do you see how since 1955, basically, it had a little bump up, but since about 1955, it is just an almost perfectly straight line. A little bit of ups and downs, but an almost perfectly straight line that belies these big jumps we see here in total employment. Employment as a percentage of the total workforce has been going down and down steadily. So these perturbations we see from recessions and, and recoveries are relatively minor when we talk about the long-term secular effect, which is less and less of our jobs, fewer and fewer of our jobs are in manufacturing as a proportion of all jobs. We see the service sector growing, uh, other sectors of the economy besides manufacturing growing, but manufacturing is on the decline and it has been on the decline now for, let's say 1960 and be generous, 60 years. I, I want to take a minute to emphasize that because what I want to point out about that is we've had Republican presidents, Democratic presidents, Republican houses, Democratic houses, Republican senates, Democratic senates 
throughout all of this. They come and they go. But the thing that is unchanging is the decline in manufacturing as a proportion of total employment. So the next time you hear a politician, and I guarantee you you're going to hear a politician talk about the importance of manufacturing jobs, manufacturing jobs this, manufacturing jobs that, manufacturing jobs blah, 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 blah. The next time you hear a politician blather on about that, I don't care what color their stripes are, right? <laughs> Doesn't matter if they're D or an R or whatever, independent, libertarian, whoever, they're all going to talk about the importance of jobs. I'm going to invite you to consider that perhaps it's because they're trying to win some votes in that particular state that might have some large sectors of the economy in, in manufacturing employment. As a total sector of the U.S. economy, it's small and getting smaller. Now, I think those jobs are important. Don't get me wrong, right? But I just think that we shouldn't pretend like it's the most important job ever because the data show us that it, sorry, my head's in the way again. There you go. I'm just going to do this. This is better, actually. I'm not, in the, I'm not in the way at all. The story we have for the data is that those jobs are less and less important, not because politicians are against them or because something bad is happening. The corporations are, are being mean to their employees, even. That might be in the you know, case here or case there. The story we see in the data here is that manufacturing is going away as a main source of employment, right? So trying to bring this back, campaigning on the idea you're going to bring back a major source of employment in manufacturing is fighting against a 60-year-long tide. That's my point. All right. Uh, thanks for listening, by the way. I hope that wasn't too <laughs> obnoxious, but I really want to put some perspective on it in a way that's not too, um, not too partisan because I think this is an issue that you hear partisanship on all the time, and then I look at the data, I'm like, there's not a whole lot of partisanship going on here. This is a long-term secular trend. Moving on. Changing the unit of analysis is a great trick to play if you don't like what the data are showing uh, it, or if, you, if the data are showing something you don't like uh, about your own performance, for example. You can just like switch up the unit of analysis. This is different than changing the data. It's using the same measure but changing the way in which it's grouped. So... Uh, I'll show you the examples and I'll try and emphasize that point. The example that Whelan gives is if you look at schools and students, it's possible that you have some bigger schools and some smaller schools. And let's say that you have some big schools that are underperforming and some small schools that are overperforming. You might want to count the number of schools that are overperforming because then you get, say, like, let's say you have two big schools and three small schools. You can say three out of five schools are doing better than average, right? Whereas if you count the test scores of the students within the schools, you might have two big schools with a lot of low test scores. And then the three small schools with high test scores don't really counteract that much. And you might have to say something like 65% of our students are below the state standard, right? Whereas if you discount schools, you could say the three small schools that are doing better, you could say three out of five of our schools are above the state standard. So changing the unit of analysis, you're looking at test scores either way, but looking at the school average test score or the student test score um, is, a, is a different unit of analysis. States versus people is another changing unit of analysis. Uh, the best example we have of this current in terms of like even slightly current is the uh, the measure of um, the electoral college and the the more recent debate about that. Um, I'm going to get some examples for you in a minute here. Um, counting countries versus counting people. If you want to argue that uh, international trade and the sort of modern uh, neoliberal trade organization. Um, has not benefited uh, the world. The best way to argue that is to count countries because there are more countries that have um, experienced economic shocks and crisis than there are people. If, on the other hand, you want to demonstrate that the um, current 
uh, well, I don't know how to say current, um, but the, the 20th century, early 21st century uh, world order of international trade and trade agreements and trade organizations has benefited uh, the world's poor, then you count people because um, arguably international trade has done a lot to lift uh, a huge number of people in places like India and China out of absolute poverty into slightly less absolute poverty, but still it's helped them um, move them up uh, in terms of the quality of their life. So counting the number of people makes it look good. Counting the number of countries makes it look bad uh, or not as good anyway. Um, and and I, I'm not gonna argue with you because I bet you you have a number you like uh, based on your opinion about world trade, not based on which data you think are better. So this classic problem of which, which do we tend to support, right? Uh, there's an old now ad about uh, cell phone networks. There was a giant fight over this between, I believe it was Verizon and AT&T, um, where one was claiming that they covered more area and the other one claimed they covered more people and both claims were true. And which one would you rather have? Would you wanna have a phone that covers more land or a phone that covers more customers? And I guess if you were a traveling salesman, then you care about coverage area. But if you're a customer, then you probably care about covering more people because you wanna make sure that you have good service in the places where there's people, right? <laughs> Which is where you're gonna be more often than not. So it's a sort of an interesting question though. It's a, I don't think that there's a, there might be a good answer for, for you depending on what kind of travel you were doing maybe, right? All right. Moving on to strategically referencing the median. Um, you can also strategically reference the mean, by the way. Uh, but strategically re referencing the median means looking at the median number uh, when the outliers might really be important, right? So you, uh, you, might, have, uh, you might have a drug that um, has, um, has some moderate effects, in, but only in 40% of the population. Um, would you reference then that the median person doesn't get better on average, <laughs> right? You probably want to know that. Or let's suppose that you have a drug that has, and drug, drug examples aren't the best examples because uh, you're required to disclose side effects even if they're, they're rare. But uh, let's suppose you have a drug that, um, that, uh, that helps some people but um, uh, kills some people. <laughs> You probably don't want to use the median outcome as like, well, people are helped on average, right? <laughs> or the median person is helped. Uh, you want to include that really bad side effect in your in your your mean. Uh, the point of this is that using both the median and the mean can be really useful. Now we talked about when the median can be really useful to us um, when we talked about the the example of the economic health of the working class or the middle class in America. And we then argue that the median is a better measure. I tend to agree because outliers, very, very rich um, income individuals or families, distort the, the mean so that the mean is much higher than, uh, the, than the bulk of people, the, the, the bulk of wage earners in the, in the middle class. Whereas the median, you know that 50% of the people earn less than that amount. And so that's representing the middle in a lot better way. Uh, a good example of this came up a while ago where um, with the, um, the, f the, first, the first year or so of the Trump administration, uh, the signature achievement of the Republican Congress under Trump uh, was a major, um, a major tax break for corporations and a small um, one-time payout to um, some taxpayers. Um, I, sh I shouldn't say one-time. Um, a small, a small payout to taxpayers that they, they, it was, the, the discussion around it was about how much people were going to get back in their taxes. And for a lot of taxpayers, it turned out to be not much at all, especially middle-class taxpayers. Um, so, so individuals like me and my wife saw, uh, saw nothing from, from this supposed um, tax cut because it, it didn't benefit us because the we had been itemizing and, and we didn't have to itemize anymore and it, it all got washed out. But 
now I'm rambling. Let's get to the point. <laughs> uh, anyway, in the in the discussion about this, some people were pointing out that the tax cuts were mostly for corporations and not really for people, even though they were purported to be for, uh, you know, helping people on their income taxes. And the um, White House press secretary at the time, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, uh, tweeted out something about, I can't understand why Americans are against this this um, this tax benefit. The average American is going to get four thousand dollars back in their more back in their tax returns, and uh, the four thousand dollars more back on their tax returns was the mean value back on tax returns. And um, people were quick to point that out because it was disproportionately a tax cut for the highest income earners, um, not for middle class income earners, and only marginally better for low um, for low low pay income earners, so people were sort of jumped on that as an example of strategically referencing the mean because the mean value was much higher because of those high paid outliers than it was for you know what what Whelan would say is a a working class or a middle class American somebody working somebody in the the middle of that um, distribution in terms of the fiftieth percentile. All right. Um, Oops, I put that in there twice. Good enough. Moving right along. Uh, we have a hard time sometimes thinking about what units we're measuring things in. And Whelan does a good job of talking about the challenge here by talking about the difference in purchasing power and currency conversion um, for money. And so we recognize that um, one yen in Japan doesn't buy the same things as one dollar in the United States. And in fact, you can get about 110 Japanese yen for one US dollar. But then you're not rich because 110 yen in Japan doesn't buy as many things as one US dollar does in, in the United States. So we always know that we convert it. But then why is it we compare 1997 dollars to 2017 dollars or why is it we compare movie theater attendance when the U.S. population was 150 million to movie theater attendance when the U.S. population was 300 million, right? So box office receipts increase year on year because of inflation, but also because there's just more people to go to a movie. So we want to use real figures, and real figures are those that are adjusted for inflation, either adjusted for the changing price of goods or the changing value of money, if you want to put it that way, or something like growing population, right? That's a, an adjusted figure is, is adjusted for um, increased population size. Some examples that Whelan gives, um, I, I mentioned movie viewership already, right? So you wanna adjust that for population. A really good example of, um, of adjusting the, uh, for real figures is looking at the federal minimum wage and adjusting for inflation, so looking at the real minimum wage, because the federal minimum wage is set by statute at a nominal figure. It's set at a dollar amount, right? A dollar amount per hour. The problem is, though, as soon as you increase the minimum wage, um, or what, just tomorrow, <laughs> um, in a time, it, it, we always have a little bit of inflation, and so then if you have a little bit of inflation, then the minimum wage becomes less, valuable. Even though it's the same amount of dollars, your dollar doesn't go as far. So here's the federal minimum wage nominally over time. What we can see here is that it hit um, $1 an hour first in the 1950s and the 1960s. It got up to $2 an hour around 1975. It was up to $4 an hour in, um, in the 1990s, up to $5 an hour in the 2000s, and then to its current level in the $7 an hour range, right? So this looks like up and up and up. And if I wanted, to, if I was opposed to the idea of increasing minimum wage, I could look at this and say, look, we've been increasing it a lot. And as a matter of fact, we increased it more recently than we have in the past. And it was good enough in the 1960s, we shouldn't do anything. But a dollar in 1960, and I'm sure you've got an older person in your life who can tell you this, right? They're like, well, I, I, well, when I was a kid, a hamburger was three cents. French fries were free. And you gave them a penny to say thank you, right? Um, no, but hamburgers did used to cost five cents, right? So 
if you if you look at this number increasing, it looks great, but is seven dollars today more than a dollar in the late 1950s an hour? The short answer is no, it wasn't. <laughs> so this this chart looks like kind of a hot mess. I apologize. The green line here is that nominal minimum wage we just saw. The red line is put in here because the graph needs to have a constant um, to to normalize against to create a real minimum wage. And what we see here is the real minimum wage. So each one of these small raises results in a really large increase in the effective purchasing power. But because of inflation, and Wheeland's got a chart like this, by the way, that's really hard to read. This is an easier chart to read in terms of just the fine tune this. As soon as you get a bump in the minimum wage, your purchasing power goes up a ton. But then because of inflation, it starts going down immediately. As soon as it happens, it goes down. Another minimum wage bump gives you a bump in purchasing power, and then it goes down again. Another wage increase, and then decrease, right? So a lot of these bumps in minimum wage and the nominal minimum wage are barely keeping up with inflation, right? You see that here in the 1970s and the 1980s, which is each bump that was increased is barely keeping up with inflation, right? This really big bump here in the end of the 1960s gave, gave a lot of purchasing power because these were more than keeping up with inflation. But then over that period of the early 1970s, it got down to where it was back in the 1960s. And then notice here that in the 1980s, and by the way, this is the start of the Reagan era, uh, which is just this is one of the economic policies that was uh, that was the idea of trickle down economics was a really big one in the early 1980s. So we saw a lot of resistance to increasing things like minimum wages, for example. Uh, we see that that these little bumps weren't enough to keep up with inflation. And then this long period of not of no increases led to a minimum wage that was effectively less uh, in terms of its real value than people have been earning, you know, any time in the previous, say, 30 or so years. And then subsequent increases in the minimum wage have really sort of maintained that, where it barely got back up to its, um, its value in the 1950s for a short period and then got back down below, right? Uh, so in the, in the late 2000s, we saw this increase bring us back up to around status quo for these periods back here. So... Hopefully that makes sense to you all that the, the, the nominal, the, the dollar figure of a minimum wage is, um, is worth less every year because of inflation. So if we want to talk about purchasing power, we need to use a real figure. All right. We talked about this briefly already. We used the Walmart uh, donating charity example, but just putting this another way, um, it's really useful to use percentages in in comparison, say 80% of this, 20% of that, right? Uh, but we have to be really careful because a large percentage of a very small number um, can still be small. So an example of this is that you can talk about something increasing your risk of cancer by 20% or 50%, right? And we get headlines that say this in the, in the media that say, you're, you know, this doing this one thing reduces your risk of cancer or increases your risk of this kind of cancer, right? And it, it sounds scary because 20%, 30%, 50% is a, is a large percentage, right? But what if I told you your chance of catching this cancer that you're at risk of increasing? So let's say I'm, I'm talking about earlobe cancer, to use a trivial example, and I say that um, sticking a Q-tip too far into your ear this is a facetious example. I hope you can understand this. Sticking a Q-tip too far into your ear increases your risk of earlobe cancer by 50%. Scary. Headlines everywhere, right? But the question you want to ask is, what are the odds I'm going to get earlobe cancer? And I say, one in a billion. So it's sticking a Q-tip too far into your ear increases your chances of getting earlobe cancer to from one in a billion to one and a half in a billion. That doesn't sound so impressive anymore, does it? A large percentage of a small number can be pretty small, right? And still, a small percentage of a large number 
can be really big, right? And so uh, one of the one of the ways that people are turning this on its head is that there there's a billionaire class that's been donating money to various causes, and people like to point out that um, you know they'll they'll give an impressive something sounding some like fifty million dollars, and they'll point out that it's like some of them be like, well, that's only point zero zero one percent. Right. Like, well, it's still 50 million dollars on the other hand. Right. So same example as I gave with the Walmart just um, put out here again. All right. Um, we had a reading about apples, oranges and eighth graders that really puts some of these some of these dilemmas over measurement into light. Uh, we have a, and, and Whelan brings this in as well. You know, actually, I'm going to pause because I want to make sure I have my reading straight. I'm not sure we had the reading this week. Okay, I just checked and I haven't assigned it yet. We're going to skip it. Don't worry about it. Uh, Wheeland has a discussion about this, so it's an interesting question, but I have something else we assigned for it. So we're going to come back to this. Um, but I... There is something important to talk about here. Uh, I want to skip over the discussion of school performance because we have a reading in the second part of the week, uh, the, the week week three, unit two module about school performance that I want to come back to this for. Uh, but Whelan makes a point here about measuring school performance. And that point is that if we incentivize schools to be evaluated on it, so if, if we, sorry, if we, incentivize students and schools to perform and our definition of performance is based on some measure in other words we let's say we have a test right and suddenly we make the test really important we say your school could get closed if your test scores aren't high enough or we say your salary depends on the test scores you get your students get right um, the risk we run is that we might improve the measure without actually improving the thing the measure is trying to do. And this is a big problem. This is a, if you take a psychology class, I'll talk to you about, uh, about measurement problems like this in particular and construct validity, uh, which is what if the test is measuring how well students take tests, but it's not actually measuring how good they are at critical thinking or learning or math or creative writing and what if we are incentivizing our students to be really good test takers because that's what we care about not really good learners which is what we're pretending to care about now i t personally tend to like tests in general so don't think i'm coming out too strong against this but i think it's a very real concern and we need to be aware of it because if we create incentives people respond to those incentives and we have to be careful about how we're measuring them. Uh, this is a big problem in medicine and this is a problem that comes up in one of the readings that is assigned for this unit for your homework uh, as well for homework assignment two, uh, which is that doctors and, doc and hospital administrators are facing some incentives to perform and the way you measure performance, like how many people die in your care um, can have some really perverse uh, uh, consequences, uh, some some opposite the intended uh, con direction of consequence. I want to pull these examples up really quick. I, I know it's been going on for a while, and I'm not on my best form today, but it's all right. We're going to get through it. <laughs> uh, I want to point up these maps. Now, one of our readings is the um, an article about the, the map that Donald Trump should hang in his... Um, his uh, office and it shows the map that he was gonna put up, which is a map of county level election results with the counties colored um, red or blue based on votes. And it's a similar map to this one. Uh, this map actually has some errors in it, so it's not even an accurate county level map. Uh, but the point that, um, that he, Donald Trump is making in tweeting this out in October of 2019 uh, is that look at how much of the country supports Donald Trump and how little of the country is opposed to him. And I don't think this is, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's hyperbolic to say that this is Donald Trump's worldview. I don't think it's crazy to think that he actually looks at this map and thinks there's only minority people that are out to get me and the majority of the country is behind me. 
Um, and, and partly because looking at this map, it looks that way, right? Uh, and so the figure here is try to impeach this. Now, the best graphical retort to this I've seen was the same words put over the electoral map by county of President Richard Nixon, because President Richard Nixon's electoral map was similarly red, right? So that that is a clever retort because it says, well, that's what Nixon's map looked like, right? Now, obviously, there's some differences between the Nixon presidency and the Trump presidency. I'm not trying to draw that parallel, but it was an interesting way of, of answering that question. Um, the, the bigger issue here, though, is that if we look at state level results instead of county level results, the maps look quite a bit different, don't they? Right. So this is a classic example of changing the unit of analysis. This is actually a really a fairly meaningless analysis. First of all, um, those of you who are thinking about this already have probably realized that counties don't vote, people vote, right? So this doesn't represent anything that actually happened in the election. But in the at the federal level for the presidential election, the electoral college votes, it's not even the people voting, right? And so the better representation of the election, the more um, nonpartisan view, if you will, is this map, which shows us the states. Now, the states are not uh, apportioned votes in the Electoral College based on their size. So this is also not the most accurate map by that standard because some states have far more Electoral College votes than others. And so if we make the map proportionate, then we end up with a map like this, which is a little weird to look at. But all of a sudden, this doesn't look like such a red map as that one, right? Uh, so. If we want to be honest to geography and uh, a little dishonest about population size, because Wyoming uh, looks as important as Washington, right? But Washington has far more electoral college votes. Uh, this map looks pretty goofy, but is more honest about the amount of ink given to each um, to each state is proportionate with its electoral college power. So in this map, we see that red won, right? So Trump won the election based on the Electoral College, uh, but not by a landslide, as sometimes is claimed, right? But by a uh, fairly, you know, a, 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 a Electoral College vi victory, but, um, but not a huge one. Other people, though, and this is depending on your partisanship, right, is more or less honest how you want to view it. Um, other people, though, sort of ignore this information about the Electoral College and just show the popular vote. So if you're in the Hillary Clinton camp, then you're probably uh, partial to maps like the one right above my head here uh, that show a bar chart of numbers of votes by county, right? So a lot of these red counties have such small populations that in, in some counties, like just a few hundred voters even, right? That were the, the reddest of counties, but just in the middle of the, of the Great Plains. Um, and then the purple counties are ones that were more evenly split. And then the bluest counties are these really massive towers where there's lots and lots of voters spatially concentrated. Um, the, um, the one on the left here is probably a little bit better in terms of understanding the, the dynamics. I think the one, the one on the right here, the one straight above my head is, is showing, you know, it's a little bit of a aha, you know, here I showed you, right? But it's good at illustrating the, the strength of the popular vote and the urban nature of democratic voting patterns by and large. But this, uh, this other map over, over here on the, um, on, to your left is, is better at showing some of that pattern without being quite as red and blue. So that purple shows us a little bit more. Let me show you a couple more um, illustrations. This, I think, is one of the best illustrations of deconstructing the visual power of that um, impeach this um, tweet, right? So this, this map is visually powerful. Um, one of the best visualizations I've seen for helping people understand the difference between land area and population size is this one. Let's go. So what this does is it takes each county in turn and transforms it into a dot and the the size of the circle is proportionate to the county's population 
So it keeps it the red and, red and blue motif, right? And if you just showed the first one, it would be hard to understand. We can pause it here as we go. I, I find this to be a really powerful data viz, and I use this with my, um, my human geography classes when we're talking about political geography. Uh, this is a little bit abstract to see, and I think having the live transformation, so just this map by itself isn't as powerful as showing the transition because then we're, I, I, it's a good teaching tool for me in geography anyway, of showing that transformation from land area to proportionate to population, right? Where we see this massive empty area here in a lot of the Intermountain West, right? Um, anyway, I thought that was a really good data viz. Moving on, this is a better illustration of the frozen map if you wanted to have one map. And this is a, uh, this cartographer, Ken Field, it, that did a great job. He used some really cool data analysis and, and interpolation with the census level tracked data uh, on, on, uh, on, sorry, census tracked level um, data about population concentrations and then um, overlaid the, uh, the smallest possible aggregated results he could find, sometimes county level, but very often, um, I think he might've been able to find precinct level polling results in some cases and overlaid that here. We really see the urban nature of democratic voting patterns by and large. We see how um, there's population clusters in some places and, and no, none in others. So, um, in terms of which map is the most honest or the best map, well, it depends on what you're trying, what question you're trying to answer. If you're trying to answer who won the presidential election, then this is a great map, right? There's the states, there's a, a electoral college vote. This is a terrible map <laughs> to answer that question, right? Because it's, it's just it's changing the unit of analysis. Uh, this map is is arguably better at really understanding the electoral college vote, but it's hard to read because it's got goofy moved around states and borders. Um, and these maps are, are again, not as good at explaining the, uh, the results of the election, but they're good at pointing out the, the popular vote, which went to um, Hillary Clinton, right? Donald Trump won the country, but had a minority uh, of the votes. This is just a cool data viz. And then this one I think is actually really good for understanding uh, the political geography of electoral politics. I think this is a really fascinating illustration. Um, now, it's harder to interpret, right? You don't see a clear winner on here, do you? <laughs> so uh, that's a little that's a little bit more interesting that way. All right. I have talked long enough. Good Lord. It's almost an hour. Uh, I need a break. You need a break. I hope you paused me sometime in the middle um, or put me on fast forward. <laughs> All right. What's the lesson of all these um, of all these tricks we've been talking about of all these um, misleading statistics? Well, it's not about bad statistics. This is not about people um, using the wrong number or a trick number, right? Uh, it's really about people finding a statistic that tells the story in a way that they find supports their aims, right? So it's people saying, oh, the mean looks better than the median, or, oh, the counties look better than the states, or vice versa, or I'm gonna show population and not the states because I want you, right? So whatever your goal is, it's people are figuring out which statistic to present, and very often selectively at the, you know, the omission of other statistics that don't support their, their, their goals. Um, and we need to be careful of that right? We need to be savvy enough consumers of it, information that we can ask that question and say, what aren't you telling me? Or what's the, I got the mean, what's the median, right? Or, or that's a really precise number, but is it accurate? That kind of question is a question we need to ask. All right, that is the end. No more. There's no more slides, right? Yes, we're done. <laughs> I'm going to sign off. Uh, I am going to post this. I'm not going to record it again. Um, it's not my proudest work, but I hope you learned a lot and uh, and didn't didn't uh, find my occasional uh, tangents or or trailings off too annoying. Thanks so much. I'll talk to you all again soon.